Passing through the gates of the country club is like passing back in time. Its first holes were laid out in 1893 in the Brookline countryside near Boston. And the following year, the country club became one of the five founding members of the fledgling United States Golf Association. It was on these grounds in 1913 that 20 year old amateur Francis we met, a former caddy who grew up across the street from the club, put American golf on the map, sending shockwaves through the sport by defeating two titans of the game, British professionals Harry Varden and Ted Ray, in an 18 hole playoff for the U.S. Open. The property feels almost prehistoric, as weathered and rugged as New England itself. The golf course wasn't so much built as it was smashed into the juxtaposed parcels of meadow, stone, ridges, and outcroppings, with blind shots, coaster-sized greens, and sudden twists that produce unexpected and unconventional results in amateur besting professionals. Every U.S. Open going to a playoff, the faded miracle of a Sunday Ryder Cup comeback. For more than a century, the country club has hosted the game's most prestigious events, Yet its turn-of-the-century design remains fundamentally unchanged and unfazed by the advances of modern golf. Its timeless presentation of the game is entirely original. Old-time golf in an old-time setting. This is every hole at the Country Club's open course. Driving off the first tee to begin a round at the Country Club is akin to bursting out of a starting gate. That's appropriate since the property originated as an equestrian club in the 1880s, and the first fairway plays down the inside stretch of the club's former racetrack on the only flat section of the property. Though the oval was removed in the 1960s, the hole follows its contours and banks left toward an elegant green, mirroring the old first turn. The aggressive line has been fortified for tournament play, but members have plenty of room to tack out to the right. Blind shots are part of the charm and the challenge of the country club, and the first one appears at the second hole. Members play it as a short par four that bends left up a hill, but in tournaments, it's a 215 yard par three to a shelved green with only the front edge visible above bunkers in the foreground. The shallow putting surface is cocked away from the tee because a pre-1900 version of the hole played up to the same green site from an angle 45 degrees farther to the right. Everything you need to know about the unmodified character of the land is embedded in the long par 4 third. Playing downhill off the tee, the fairway writhes left and right, slithering through a gap between fescue-covered embankments. Most players will try to position drives to leave a clear avenue to the green, but more often they'll be blocked out by one of the ridges. Tony Lima said players hitting approaches in the 1963 US Open had to get used to aiming at nothing but blue sky. The pond beyond the green is where generations of local children learned to skate, including Tenley Albright, who won figure skating gold in the 1956 Olympics. The strong par 4 fourth launches off a rocky precipice to a blind fairway that swerves to the right. The staggered fairway shape adds to the difficulty of hitting it, but maintaining control here and elsewhere is crucial if shots are going to hold the legendarily small and tilted greens. Unlike many old courses, most of the country club's greens are canted diagonally or laterally to the line of approach. The best example is the fourth, which tips sharply from back right to front left, producing big bending putts, which can be terrifyingly fast from above the hole. Some players will try to launch the ball as far up the hill at the short fifth as possible, while others will lay back to a comfortable wedge distance. Either way, the green is difficult to hit. The putting surfaces average just 4,400 square feet, second only to Pebble Beaches as the smallest in major championship golf, and that's after a green expansion program by Gil Hans and Jim Wagner enlarged them by roughly 20%. The edges at the fifth were pushed back out to their lost dimensions, bringing the surrounding bunkers and false front more into play. Tree removal has exposed the lovely mesa formation of the sixth hole, with views that now glide down past the fallaway putting surface all the way to the third green. The chocolate drop mounds on the right, a curious kind of hazard even for good players, reminds us of the hole's vintage. It's the only one remaining from the expanded nine-hole course that Willie Campbell, the club's first professional, built when he arrived from Musselburg in 1894. The seventh hole moves from high point to high point toward a green notched into the course's nerve center a promontory ridge that's the home base for four greens and four sets of tees. 
A 290-yard carry will get drives to an upper-level garden spot past the third fairway bunker, leaving just a flip wedge approach. But bowl-like mounding right and behind the putting surface will funnel in longer shots too. During the 1999 Ryder Cup, Tiger Woods chipped in on seven from 60 feet to jumpstart his Sunday singles route of an overmatched Andrew Coltart. In the late 1920s, William Flynn built the club a new nine called Primrose on 55 acres of recently annexed land. The additional nine allows the country club to mix and match holes from across the entire property to create a special routing used only for major events. The composite arrangement, now called the Open Course, features holes from the main course that members play day to day, plus four more holes from Primrose. A previous configuration was used in the 1963 and 1988 U.S. Opens and also the 1999 Ryder Cup, but a new sequencing, put in place for the 2022 U.S. Open, eliminates some previous long walks between holes and now places the 9th green and 10th tee closer to the central promontory and practice area. Members play this gradually uphill par 5 as the 14th hole of the main course. For major tournaments going forward, it will be utilized as the 8th. In the old days, the drive played over an exposed quarry, a rough area that was part of the club's steeplechase run that's now been filled in. Aggressive players can let out the shaft to get into position to reach the green in two, but the real trick is in the approach that must carry well onto the putting surface as anything landing slightly short will return 30 yards down the steep facing slope, leaving an awkward pitch back up to a blind green. One of the joys of playing older golf courses is encountering unusual features that later architects would have altered. The ninth is an example, the first encounter with the Primrose 9, its ninth hole as well. The magnificent tee shot flies downhill over rock formations toward a large knob 280 yards out that kicks drives down and right toward a pond, forcing players to either challenge the left side of the hole or lay back short of the downslope. The green, slipped into the foot of the base ridge, is one of the most subtly deceptive on the course. The section of land comprising most of the next three holes wasn't acquired until 1905, but thank goodness it was. The surreal topography makes the 10th, known as Himalayas, one of the most distinctive holes in America. Like the third, this massive par four weaves a strange voyage through Paleolithic terrain. In this case, outcroppings of Roxbury Pudding Stone, one on the left and one farther up on the right. In the Saturday Ryder Cup matches, when the hole was played as a par five, Davis Love's drive came to rest atop these rocks. From there, he nuked a long iron into a green that saddled into a craggy bluff, the ball stopping eight inches from the hole for a conceited eagle. Members played the par 3 11th as their 12th hole, but the short downhill par 3 hasn't been used in a major championship since 1913. Though it's called Redan, it doesn't play like one. The shot here is pure target golf, but the name is believed to have come from the club's second professional, Alex Nipper Campbell, also from Scotland, who was an advisor to the members who constructed the hole around 1905, several years before the debut of the more famous version of the Redan at the National Golf Links of America. If there's anything close to an ordinary hole on the open course, it would be the par 4 12th. A drive over 300 yards will bounce past a crest in the fairway if it avoids the bunkers and show a clean look at another small green nestled into the promontory. Few holes better represent the importance of knowing where to miss and where not to miss shots at the country club. The tiny, wickedly tilted putting surface, protected by cross bunkers and chocolate drop mounding, makes recoveries miserable from left, right, or behind the green. The 13th hole on the open course doesn't actually exist. During championships, Primrose's par four first and par three second playing across the lake are combined to make one longer blind and narrow par four with the obsolete first green converted to fairway. The hole gave Arnold Palmer nightmares. During the 1963 US Open, he recorded two triple bogeys on the hole, including one in the playoff with Jackie Cupid and eventual champion Julius Boros when he hit his drive into a dead tree stump and in a very Palmer-esque way, tried to play it out. If you could only watch play on one hole during the US Open, you'd want to pick the par 5 14th, another one-of-a-kind expression of metamorphic geology. The shot dispersion would be fascinating. Normally Primrose's par 4 8th, 
The 14th is stretched to over 600 yards and divided into two sections, a flat lower region and an upper fairway elevated nearly 20 feet over a rocky incline. Drives missed in the rough will leave long, blind, curving second shot attempts, and those that draw bad lies may not even be able to make it to the upper plateau. If that weren't enough, the green is minuscule, flanked by bunkers, and not particularly receptive. Another blind drive off the back tee of 15 plunges off a bluff back to the beginning section of the property, where the land in the early years was leveled to accommodate polo and horse racing. The straightaway par 4 plays across the club's entrance road to a fairway grade green that's been significantly expanded on the right and rear. Every major competitor going back to We Met, Varden, and Ray has had to fight through the nerve-wracking four-hole closing lap that begins here, with some holding it together better than others. The 16th is tucked into the northeast corner of the property and encircled by nothing good. The shot to the green is all carry with only the left half visible, the right side hidden behind a wide mouth fronting bunker that kicks everything forward. But balls played strongly toward the left edge can catch a slope and ride back to right hand hole locations. Tiger Woods, Hal Sutton, and Tom Lehman each closed out their Ryder Cup singles matches on this green, earning critical early points in the American team's come from behind win. The 17th, a shortest dogleg four that invites long drivers to cut the corner, isn't one of the greatest holes in the US, but it is one of the most historic, with a ruthlessly slick green. Francis We Met hold long birdie putts here in both the final round and the playoff to knock out Varden and Ray. Julius Burroughs made a critical three here as well that put him at the top of the leaderboard as Arnold Palmer, Jackie Cupid, and Tony Lema all took bogey or worse. And one of the most famous putts ever sunk was Justin Leonard's cross-green, pandemonium-inducing birdie to have his match against Jose Maria Olathabal and secure the half point the U.S. team needed to complete their legendary comeback. Though not the brute it once was, the closing hole is anything but a handshake. Ask Curtis Strange, who in the 1988 U.S. Open had to make a gutsy up-and-down par out of the deep fronting bunker to force a playoff with Nick Faldo, which he won the next day. The par-4 heads home in the opposite direction of the first hole, bending down the back stretch of the old racing oval toward a green perched under the gaze of the clubhouse patio. It's an appropriately mannered conclusion to one of the game's most raucous cross-country journeys. Since 1893, the country club has been a respite in a rapidly moving world. Though the golf course has evolved and matured, it's resisted the large-scale modernizations and remodels so many of its peers have endured and subsequently had to correct. The club knows what it is and what it stands for, and has never wavered in its responsibilities as one of the founding fathers of American golf. And yet, from Francis we met to Tiger Woods, from the Haskell Ball to today's futuristic technologies, the course has remained not just relevant, but revelatory. The more golf changes, the more the country club stays the same.